Hallelujah. Is it streaming now? Okay. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to begin a new course. Course 124. 124. Course 124 is on marriage and family, a kingdom perspective. Can we say it together? Amen. Marriage and family, a kingdom perspective. And those of you who are online, you can check if the sound is good enough. Please let uh, you can inform us and so that we can make adjustments. We have some technical issues right here that we believe we'll be able to communicate. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of beginning a new course today. There's none like unto you. We rely on you alone. That which is in your word, reveal to us and grant us understanding. Thank you for answering our prayer. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, marriage and family, a kingdom perspective, is a presentation of the institution of marriage in a way that can only be understood if you embrace the Bible as a sure foundation of life and godliness. In other words, when we say marriage and family, we are taking it from the point of view of the kingdom and marriage as the primary institution of the kingdom on earth. Can we say primary? primary. You see, marriage and family, they reflect something profound. At the base of society is the family. At the base of the kingdom on earth is the family. And so if Satan seems to be very interested in this institution and seems to want to distort it, you need to know why. The reason is that marriage reminds Satan of Yeshua that defeated him at the cross. When you see a woman that you don't like the husband, there is always bile that runs in you. So there's bile that runs in Satan when he sees the church of Yeshua. And so men and brethren, marriage is the highest expression of unity on earth. You see, unity is something that Yeshua desired for his church. He desired it that his church would be united, be one. In John 17, he prayed to the Father. He didn't just pray to the Father for unity. In chapter 17, verse 20 to 23, he told us the type of unity he desired, that they may be one as the Father is one. You know, with him and he one with the Father, so he desires that marriage will be. In other words, men and brethren, what we are about to study, and there will be various parts to it, is a comprehensive manual, the way the Lord gave it. So we are not studying marriage from United Kingdom point of view. We are not studying marriage from even Christian religion point of view. And listen, no country has the rights or the ability to define marriage. You can define civil union. It's your right. As a nation, nations have legal systems. They can decide to create opportunity for civil union and they can decide to create anything they want. But when it comes to marriage, there's only one marriage culture, which is part of the culture of the kingdom of heaven in the earth realm. And that is why I want to say to you, whether you are one who has lived, you have, you have been married for 7, 10, 20, 30 years, or you are just 3, 4, 5 years in marriage, or you have not even started. This is a cause you've got to give attention to. Because the Lord is going to expand it beyond what we have ever known, even in this commission. Amen? Amen. The Lord has been speaking to me for some time. He said, when it's time to give this course, just as it's been expanding all the courses, there will be great expansion. This institution is one that if people understand it, they will understand that they can truly please Elohim. They can truly please Him. And if they don't understand it, they can continue to do their own thing the way they wanted and 
If you want to understand marriage, you've got to go back to the Bible. If you go to the Bible, the first thing you take note is how did the kingdom of heaven come into the earth realm? There is Elohim who is in heaven. He created heaven and earth. Now, the other day, Pastor Grace and I, as we were flying back from the U.S., you know, the satellite was showing us all the places we were flying to. The one thing that was so clear, when you see this earth like a small globe, a small ball in the midst of the universe, you begin to appreciate that this earth is too small. And then most of it is water. Water. Two thirds of it is water. So even the landmass itself, you find that it has a problem. The landmass is small. So how did the earth become something that how did the earth become something that is profoundly significant in the affairs of Elohim and mankind? And so we need to understand that Genesis chapter 1 is not just any scripture. Genesis chapter 1 is an introduction to how the kingdom of heaven was extended to the earth tree. Can we say kingdom of heaven? Yeah. Extended, extended to the earth tree. Yeah. And what is it about this extension you need to know? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 25, that Elohim began to create an earth. He could have breathed the earth into existence in one day. He could have spoken it into one day. He could have just done something and that is the earth. But that's not what Elohim did. He took five days to prepare an ecosystem that will sustain man. Why? He wanted to create man from the dust of the earth. And wanted to breathe into man the breath of the spirit. So, mankind was special in the entire creation of Elohim. And so, look at what he said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them take note there. Let them, you see, religion doesn't teach this depth. Religion teaches about God having created man and giving the dominion mandate, and then after, maybe as an afterthought. But in the mind of the father, when he was giving, creating man, and giving him the dominion mandate, he says, let us create man, that is humankind. Can we say humankind? humankind. In our image, after our likeness. Why image, why likeness? It was the way the Lord wanted it to be. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth. You see, that was the mandate Elohim gave to humankind. The mandate to exercise dominion. Somebody said dominion. Now, this is not the dominion as is taught by the people who call the dominionalists. There's what we call the dominionalists. The dominionalists are people who say, we are just going to take over. We're going to take over government. We're going to take over um, media. We're going to take over sports and all that. Well, that is a wrong interpretation of the dominion mandate. Now, the earth, as we know, has fallen. But we need to know the original mandate Elohim gave. He didn't create mankind to be victim. He didn't create mankind to be victim of circumstance. He created mankind to exercise dominion on his behalf, not over one another, but over all the things he created. Can we say all the things he created? So, in other words, Elohim is in heaven where he's seated on the throne in his kingdom. He made a decision. He wanted to extend his kingdom to the earth realm. And if he was going to extend his kingdom to the earth realm, he was going to create all kinds of creatures on earth. And then he needed something or a being that had part of him. 
a being that can also function on earth. That's why if you go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it says that Elohim molded the earth, created shape of a man, and breathed into him the breath of life. The whole idea being that Elohim wanted to create man with his capacity and yet with the ability to stay on earth. So that is why mankind, listen to this, most of our body is made up of water and earth. Once the spirit is out, the spirit is the spirit and the soul, the eternal part. Once they leave the body, what remains, keep it in the earth for just three weeks, one month, it decomposes. Leave it for some time, further decompositions go, go on. Now, the point we are making is this. Look at verse 27. So, Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim created he him. Male and female created he them. In other words, in the mind of Elohim on creation morning was the reality that this earth realm which he has created is not going to be one that will be um, 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 populated by one gender. The Lord had in mind the gender of malehood and the gender of femininity to be joined heirs of this earth realm. Amen? Then verse 28, So Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Take note of that. Be fruitful. Multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every half bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree you seed, you sh to you it shall be for meat. So we see here the Lord talk about man's dominion is over nature, over the environment, over the other creation. There's no place where man gave to the malehood dominion over femalehood or malehood over other creatures because dominion over humans belongs to Elohim alone. Can we say it together? Dominion over humans belongs to Elohim alone. But he gave of his own will, he gave humankind the authority to be his regent. So that's why we are like ambassadors of the kingdom on earth. We are like ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven in the earth realm. We are representatives of Elohim. You must ask yourself the question, are you functioning at the realm where you see yourself as an ambassador of heaven? Are you a victim of circumstances? Then you know you are out of alignment. It's not the will of the Father. Don't accept that state until the Father gets you to where he wants to get you. Where you can begin to exercise dominion over the sphere of influence the Lord granted to you. There's a sphere of influence. And you need to know that sphere of influence. We are simply taking an introduction into this issue of marriage because when you don't understand this introduction, you miss it entirely. Now, Genesis 1 is a statement of purpose. Can we say statement of purpose? The actual execution of what the Lord proposed is found in Genesis chapter 2. For instance, verse 7 talks about how he created man from the dust of the earth and how he gave man the ability to represent. And so, by the grace of the Lord, when Elohim created man with the ability to represent him, we need to understand something that then, in the course of creating what he had proposed, we need to know how it was implemented. Statement, Genesis 1, a statement of purpose, where the Lord said, this is what I want to do. Then the actual execution of what he said in Genesis chapter 1 is found in Genesis 2. So how then did the Lord fulfill his plan in Genesis 1? In Genesis chapter 2, we are told in verse 7, he molded man out of raw earth and breathed into him his nostrils, the breath of life. What does that mean? 
Man was created and molded from the earth. And then the Lord put a measure of his spirit into man. And man became a living soul. That's how we have the three dimensions of human beings. Spirit, soul, and body. The body molded. The spirit imparted. Then when the spirit touched the body, he created the third compartment called the soul. The soul is the realm of self-expression. The soul is where you have the mind, the will, the emotion, where you have the memory, where you have the faculty for reasoning. The soul is where you interact with your environment. The body is the physical house. The spirit came from the Lord. Amen? Now, the Lord began to tell man that he created all that he was to do. Then in verse 18, we have said something. I want you to take note of from verse 18. And we're going to look at verse 18 to 25, uh, a little bit more. And the Lord Elohim said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Let's stop right there. Elohim said, It's not good that man should be alone. The man he created, Adam, he said, I don't want, it's not good for him to be alone. For him to fulfill the dominion mandate that I gave to him, I will make him and help meet for him. Now, we need to understand this phrase. That number one thing to understand there is that marriage is an institution from God, Elohim. So, governments cannot legislate marriage. Church cannot legislate marriage. Society cannot legislate marriage. Listen, every government has a right to do whatever it wants and say, oh, this arrangement we want to make for people to live together. They can make arrangement for people to, you know, stay together. You meet somebody in the office, you agree, and that day you go to the home of that person. Government can make it. They are permitted to do whatever they want. But when it comes to what is called marriage, you cannot undo what you didn't create. Can we say it together? You cannot undo what you didn't create. Can we also say you cannot modify what you didn't create? The Lord said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. This raises another issue that when it comes to marriage, and I want you all to listen to this, it's not enough to grab any man or any woman. It's not enough to be guided by your emotion, by your sentiment. It's not enough to, oh, somebody told you this person is wonderful. Oh, your mother told you, hey, you know what? Um, please, my daughter, tell me. You'll never disappoint me. Say, Mom, what is it? They say, listen, you know, this is our tribe. Oh. Tell, promise me you will not marry outside our tribe. Now, those things people did in the days of ignorance. It's not your mom that will define marriage for you. It's not your dad. It's not your friends. It's not your contemporaries. Marriage and everything about it should be defined by the Lord. It's he who we grow into. And if true marriage must take place, or the one that is ideal in his sight, is the one in which people who are brought into marriage, they locate and find each other in him. They do what? Locate and do what? Find each other in him. When they locate and find each other in him, there's safety. When they locate and find each other in him, it is healthy. When they locate and find each other in him, there is security. Because marriage involves three personalities. Number one, Elohim, who created. Then number two, the man. Number three, the woman. Now we're told in verse 19, and out of the ground. The Lord Elohim formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, 
there was not found an help meet for him. Now the Lord did something wonderful. He gave Adam the status of a co-creator. He created, brought to Adam. He gave Adam the wisdom. If he named it alligator, so it was alligator. Lion, elephant, chimpanzee, whatever name he gave it became the name. Elohim himself said, hey, this earth I'm giving to the sons of men. I want to demonstrate what I mean. I want to elevate Adam to the point where he can name the things I created. And whatever name he gave to them, that's the name. Then all of these things, none of them was found fit to be the helpmate of Adam. Elohim created them. And what happened? Now look at verse 21. This is so important. And the Lord Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. Take note of that. When marriage, true kingdom marriage, needs to be preceded by sleep. I will say it together. True kingdom marriage needs to be preceded by sleep. Now this is contrary to what you learn from all the pseudo kingdom uh, ministries and all the uh, buy one get one free type of ministries. Because they tell you look well. Look well. Define what you want. Define what you want. You want a, a person who is slim. Define it for God. You want that qualification. Somebody who has that qualification. Define it. And men are defining. Women are defining. People are defining. Unfortunately in the defining. People are walking away from Elohim. They are taking him out of contention. They are doing their own stuff. It's in the. It's in the walking by sight that the worst mistakes are made in a faulty foundation of marriage. Listen to this. Take note of this. We walk by faith, not by sight. You've heard that, isn't it so? You know what Romans chapter 8 says from verse 5 to verse 9. The carnal mind, it says, is enmity against Elohim. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, all of it. He says, the carnal mind received not the things of the spirit of Elohim. Over the course of 30 something years of observing this institution, one thing we have noted is this. That if you don't fall asleep, or if you don't allow Elohim to put you to sleep, you will choose what you want. And what you want is, can be, it can work out, it may not work out. Most of the time, what you want can be the very things that you are going to be disappointed in very soon. Okay, you seem to like people who are one type. Praise the Lord. Three years down the line, that very thing that drew you is no longer there. Or is expired. It's happened to many people. People have been drawn by feature. They've been drawn by emotional the drawback, these things are passing. Emotion is yo-yo. Emotion may one day nice, one day sore. And when the emotion is no longer there, you have all kinds of things. Listen, I know a family. I know a people very close to where I live, where I grew up. The compound next to it. She married somebody where my sister lives. The home of my sister. Not far from where. These two people married. At Christ Church Oweri. That day they married was the end of the wedding. The end of the marriage. That day. They didn't get home. What was the problem? Just gift. Whose family would take your gifts? Is it the family of the man or the family of the woman? That's all. Can you imagine? Are you understanding what I'm saying? That's serious. I said that day, the, the marriage was not consummated. They didn't get home. They didn't live together for one day till today. We're talking about something that's over 25 years old or so. It's terrible. You hear all kinds of things. But most of the time, if you dig well, it is that somewhere along the line, people put Elohim aside. I say, hey, you know what? You're an old man. They don't speak it orally. You are senile. 
I'm a modern person. I know what I want. I want a showstopper. I want somebody who's dressing is such that once we get into any event, everybody must turn to see. Men who are here, you know, before we got born again, you know, this kind of things used to read. Is it that so? <laughs> I tell you, if you know some of these people marry, the ones they will tell you with their tongue, and the ones that we can only know on the day of eternity, you know that people joke with eternity. You see, Elohim caused Adam a deep sleep to fall upon him, to take away his senses. To take away his carnality. To put, shut down the voice of the flesh. Take note. The reason for the deep sleep was to shut down the voice of the flesh. So that Adam will not choose with sight. Adam will not choose with emotion. Adam will not choose with what he had. Adam will not imagine what he wanted. A deep sleep. Until the deep sleep comes upon you, you truly are not ready for marriage. As long as you can make your choices, you don't need Elohim. He's a visitor. And the Lord said, no. I am the author of marriage. I know what lies behind the veil. I know what lies behind the packaging you are seeing. That packaging which will live for only 80 years, 85 years. The spirit man and the soul that will live forever inside. I know what is inside. And I know what I bring together. That when I bring them together, there's a clicking in the spirit that will outlast every challenge to come. Because the proof of marriage is not at the beginning. The proof of marriage is not when everything is okay. When you are coasting and an autopilot, the proof of marriage is in the crisis, the storms that will come. And let me tell you this. Perhaps there are 10 to 15 percent of people who graciously never experienced any storm. The honest truth is that for the vast majority of people, 85% or more storms will come. They'll come in different ways. They'll come in area of expectations that are not met. They'll come in form of many challenges that will come. That's when you know whether the Lord was in it. And so the Lord is saying, no need to take a chance. Let me put you to sleep. For young people out there, young people who are just coming out of school, you are learning, okay, get a good job, marry, bear children, and then that's it. No, it's not the way it is. The Lord, verse 20, 21, the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. Some of us he slept. May those who are looking for married party partners go to sleep. When you go to sleep, you won't see. When you go to sleep, your senses will not walk. When you go to sleep, you will rest in the Lord only. And you never move until he tells you to move. And you will do what he wants you to do. And we are told in the book of, um, in the book of Genesis 2 verse 21, the Lord Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And then what happened? In the midst of that sleep, Elohim did the first operation recorded in the Bible. There's the first operation. And he took one of his ribs. He took what? One of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. He took a rib away. It was a surgical operation. Elohim could have settled for a big animal or a creeping animal, I mean a crippled uh, uh, creature or a flying one, he could have done for anything. No. He could have even created a woman the day he created Adam, but that's not what he did. Take note. He caused a deep sleep, and as he slept, Elohim did an operation and opened up the uh, side of Adam, and what did he do? He took one of his ribs and close up the flesh instead thereof. Verse 22. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man. Made he a woman. And brought her unto, him, unto the man. Take note of that. That rib he took away. He put flesh on it. And he made a woman. Elohim made a woman. 
and brought her to Adam. There's something we need to take note of here. And we can break it down further. Number one, he didn't take from his, the legs of Adam the bones there. Because that would have meant that Adam was now to march upon her. He didn't take from any other way. He took from the rib cage. Why? Marriage is a heart issue. Can we say heart issue? Heart issue. And so he chose an instrument that is one of the, um, what do you call it, protection. One of the protective instruments that keeps the heart. The heart which is the heart of man. The very core of man. If a heart is shattered by a bullet, a person is gone. So the very thing that covers the heart is what Elohim took a rib, one of it, a vital part in the life of Adam, took, created a woman and brought to him. Men and brethren, womankind was created from man. We can also learn that. You see, there are some people who have allowed the things they've gone through in life to make them to hate men. You know what I'm talking about? It's easy to allow what you have gone through because of the way you were misread, mistreated by a man. You now begin to hate men. There are people who hate women till today. Once they hear about women, they roll themselves. This is a dangerous state to be in. Someone say danger. No, you don't. Don't allow whatever you went through with anyone. Don't allow your past to trap your future. There are people who are not able to receive the grace to press on in their life because they allow bitterness with something that happened in the past to trap them. And that bitterness becomes self-destructive. So, it was told that he took her, made a woman and brought her to him. Now, there's another thing we need to say there. When Adam was created in Genesis 2, 7, raw eggs molded breath of life into it. When a woman was to be created, he didn't go back to that same formula. He rather took from man a woman. What did this signify? In creating womankind, Elohim wanted to create a more refined version of man. Can we say more refined? That refinement is so important and the women who understand that refinement, they operate in it, it works for them. Those who don't understand it, they miss the essence. What do we mean? Here is a form man from Elohim. And when it was time to create the woman, he didn't go back to the raw earth. He went from the refined person to create another level. That's why women tend to have greater sensitivity to things of the spirit. Because there's a refinement in their creation. That's why women are tender than men generally. Because there's a refinement to their creation. That's why women are more sensitive to things of Elohim. Because there's a refinement to their creation. That's why the woman can see into the realm of the spirit more than men. Because there's a refinement to their creation. Unfortunately, this also, on the negative side, is the reason why a lot of women tend to be, you know, clients of deliverance ministers more than men. You go to most deliverance ministries, at times it's 90% of their clients are women. So what's going on? It's because that openness, if you don't know how to handle it, you see, the spiritual realm is open, good and bad, angels and demons. So a lot in that sensitivity, when they don't accompany with spirituality, they open themselves up to demonic oppression. They, for instance, the emotion. They open it up and the emotion begins to rule them. They are ruled by their feeling. And they get angry, they get offended, you know, with things. And when those things happen, they are not able to handle them. So, men and brethren, there's a refinement behind the creation of womanhood. All men must know that. That's why when he calls them weaker vessel, it's not weaker as in uh, more uh, men have stre greater strength. Anybody, listen, any man who can do what women can do must be a very extraordinary man. Women can multitask. 
You see women, they run the home, they run the home, they prepare, they handle the kitchen, they do all that, they, they, they take care of the husband, they take care of the children, they take care of the household. Most men can't do that. So the weaker vessel didn't mean weaker as in less strength, less ability. It's simply talking about this refinement has created in them certain level of sensitivity, certain level of softness, certain level of meekness that people misinterpret or mistake for weakness. And that's not right. Because meekness is not weakness and can never be. As a woman, don't let circumstances make you lose your meekness. Your meekness is one of your battle acts. It's one of the most powerful tools. The Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. So in a city like London, where there's pressure to survive, most times one of the things that Satan takes away first from women is meekness. That very thing, the Lord made them soft and tender. Because of the need to make up and pay the bills and pay the mortgage and do this and that, most times Satan's first target is to take away that meekness, that softness, that tenderness, so that the woman can become like men. And in the process, once it happens, you see a woman labor and sweat so much and can begin to believe in that labor and sweating and before you know it, can never rest, can never get some confidence in the Lord, rest in the Lord that he will do it and they begin to run arm of the flesh. And so it must be avoided. So we're told in verse 25 of Genesis 2, and Adam said, he said, and brought her unto the man. Elohim brought her. For those who are single, may Elohim bring your Eve. May he bring. Not you go get. Bring him. Find her in the Lord. Let the Lord be the one deciding. Let the Lord be the one leading. Let the Lord be the one directing. Let the Lord be the one that brings her to you. Because there are many ways we can mis, mis, misdo it. And it doesn't make sense. If the Lord brings her, she'll fit into you. Amen? It's a promise. If the Lord brings her, she'll fit in. And two of you shall become one. Then look at verse 30, 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The womb man. The woman with the womb. The man with the womb. How did she know? How did Adam know? He knew by the spirit. He was asleep. This operation happened. But he woke up. He recognized. You know what? Every man should be able to pick out your wife out of a billion women. Every man. If you are tuned to heaven, if you hear from the Father, you should be able to know that you know this is the one the Lord has ordained for me. And there are a thousand women that could be more pretty to other eyes, they may could be more beautiful to other eyes, but to you, that's the epitome. Amen? Amen. And it is something you must know that when you say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it is in marriage that it is not just a truism, it is life itself. That you come to a place where you accept the one from the Father for you. You embrace, you celebrate. It's everything to you because you have no standard by which to judge her. Standard she didn't attain to. No, she's unique. She's bespoke, created for you, specifically for you. Men and brethren, these are important principles. The Lord wants us to lay a foundation of these things so that when we lay and understand this foundation, I want you all to read Genesis chapter 2, all of it, and especially verse 18 to 25. Then he says, it shall be called woman. Why? She was taken out of the man. May you find the one taken out of you. And when you find the one taken out of you, may you treasure. May you treasure. May you celebrate. May you be one who is grateful to the Father. Amen. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Now this is a principle. Now say, listen, Adam spoke. This is the bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. Then the word came in here. 
For that reason. Because marriage is an institution from the Lord. Because he is the author. He is the finisher also. He is the one who it emanates from. He is the one who will process. He is the one that knows who fits into who. He knows who. And if you're a woman, you're not married, you know, people like, see you here, you are not for everybody. It doesn't matter how much money, how much education, how much status, you are for that one from whose rib you were taken. Does that make sense? And when that one appears, you will know. You will know. You will know. We're going to talk about how you know. We're going to talk about them. This course is going, is going to be strongly because it's not going to be a book. It's going to be expanded for all things. We're going to have a, a session. Pastor Grace will teach one or two sessions. Some of the things we take people through when we do counseling. We take them through a curriculum of issues. She will come and do that one one of the days. We are not going to rush this course because it is so foundational. By the time you understand it, all of you here will be people who can teach others. And the Lord will bless you. Because this institution is under assault. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She had become woman because she was taken out of man. Then he said, therefore, 24, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Take note, look up here. He said, for this reason, when it comes to marriage, it is the beginning of a new race. It's the beginning of a new family of Elohim. It's the beginning of a new lineage. It's the beginning of a new tribe. That's the reality. It may be denied. You know, at times you find some people, oh, we are very close brothers. Three brothers, they are very close. They eat together. They do everything together. And when one wants to marry, they say, you know what? Oh, yes, this wife is you are our wife. Fa, 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 fa. It's not true. It's not true. You're not our wife. You are his wife. It may, it may be a bitter pill to swallow. But the reality is the day that brother, out of those three very tight brothers, they do everything together, they have joint account, they have a business, so and so brothers limited. The day that one says he has received of the Lord to marry, that day the person has done a living. If he doesn't do that living, that marriage is going to crash. Not just brother, sister, but father, mother. Why? Because marriage begins a new creation, a new lineage, a new tribe. That doesn't mean you neglect them. No, listen. That doesn't mean you forsake them as in, you know, ignoring them and not supporting them. No, that's not what we're talking about. Marriage is not to divide. Marriage is to expand. But in practical terms, the person who is marrying is leaving the oversight of the house. You now have a new companion with whom and through whom both of you will now enter God's purposes for you as a couple. You are no longer going to be bound by the old arrangements that sustain the family. Those old arrangements have done their assignment. When that first person is ready to marry, is ready to become a man. So therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. You know what the word cleave is? Look at it this way. Cleave. The modern word is cling. Someone say cling. Cleave to your wife. Cling to her because two of you are now one. They shall be what? One flesh. One flesh. Nothing in between them. One flesh. Nothing. Now you see a lot, all kinds of things, you know, it's been glamorized by all these uh, celebrities who are getting so-called marriage. They say, we want to do prenup, prenup, prenup. Have you, hey, friends say, hey, you mean after being all this successful, you have 35 million in the account, you have seven houses, huh? you just want to give it away? You know what? They go to a lawyer, they say to the woman, or the woman is successful, say to the man, let's have a prenuptial agreement. Agreement that says, I'm coming to this marriage with these assets. And you are coming with those assets. If this marriage does not work, we will separate and we own what we used to own before we married. 
You know what? These are arrangements of men. They don't stand before Elohim. They don't stand. Marriage introduces a new reality. Can we say it together? Marriage introduces a new reality. And that new reality is that they two shall become one flesh. They are not one. Before the Lord, they are one. They are one in everything. And that one is not in one area. Listen, it's in everything. One that they own each other's body. They own each other's assets. They are not visitors. They are not strangers. It's not a big deal if a man, you know, um, writes a will and says, all that I ever own and earn, my wife is the chief beneficiary. It's not a big deal. It's not something to say, oh, he did something. No, it's not something. That's basic. That's fundamental. Are you hearing me, brethren? It's one. Everything you are, because you come to marriage. When you come to marriage, you are coming with everything you are. You are coming with all the good in you. All the deficiencies in you. You are coming with the good, the bad, the ugly. And the two come to match together. When you don't recognize this, you are laying the foundation of failure. You don't keep back anything. You don't keep back something. You don't even make anything conditional. Access to each other, no condition, nothing. Oh, access to finances is not conditional. That's why it is said, be sure that whoever you are marrying is the will of the Father. The moment you say, I do, two of you have dissolved into one. One mindset. And that's why the Lord expects people that when you marry, you must be very realistic and do an audit of each other. Your strengths and weaknesses. And if it is kingdom marriage, if it is kingdom marriage, in the area where one has competence, the other should willingly accept that competence. In every area of life, in where somebody has better competence. We're talking about competence that will lead to eternity. Any area somebody has competence, it is now our. Marriage introduces the concept of we. Somebody say we. we. Not me. Us. Not I. Our. Not mine. Let me take it again. Marriage introduce the concept of we not I us not me ours our money our home our car does that make sense? Yes, and it's so important and look at verse 30 to verse 25 and they were both naked the man and his wife and we're not ashamed. They were both naked. Talking about intimacy. There's a level of intimacy that is permissible only in marriage. And that intimacy is the place where the Lord has ordained that because they are one. It's legal. It's moral. It's spiritual. What you cannot do in any other setting... If you do it, it will be a sin. If you do it, it will be repulsive, repugnant. In marriage, there is a different ball game. And that is why when you marry, you cannot withhold any aspect of you. Money, time, you know, body, whatever. It cannot be in any shape withheld. So men and brethren, it's also important for us to know that marriage is a union, therefore. Someone say marriage is a union. It is the dissolution of two beings into one new personality and identity, both in the court of heaven, in the church of Yeshua, and in society. That's what it means. They were both naked. They were not ashamed. Because it's one. It's one. There should be nothing that should be withheld from each other. You don't make, get into marriage and you have some secret bank account to use. You can't get into marriage. You have some secret plans. 
Supposedly it doesn't work. It's a sacred union. Sacred. That's why it's the only thing that the Lord could use to illustrate the union between Yeshua and his church, his marriage. In Ephesians chapter 5, 21 to 33. Men and brethren, marriage is profound. Marriage is serious. And marriage is for all of life. Now there are a few things I'll say before we close today. One of them is this. Not everyone will marry. Not everyone will marry. And the Lord would like us to know in the course of this course that when we understand we are not going to put onto us what the Lord hasn't given us capacity for. Because in Matthew chapter 19, Yeshua, remember Yeshua. You remember the case of Yeshua? In the book of Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, in chapter 5, he said, Moses said to you, but I say this to you. Moses said, and I for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I say, okay, he was giving us the understanding that as the king of kings, he's the king of the kingdom. His word is superior to that of Moses. So in Matthew 19, the Lord said, not everybody should marry. Not everybody can marry. Why? He said there are people who are given special grace, a gift called celibacy. Someone say celibacy. Celibacy is the gift and capacity and ability to be able to serve the Lord without feeling any pressure for affection for womanhood and for manhood, as the case may be. Because celibacy is not a gift only for men, it's also for women. And one of the problems of the Church of Rome is they, didn't, they created celibacy religiously because there was a time when, when bishops die, their children will go and and uh, uh, place a demand on court for release of the church building. I mean, the uh, place where the bishop lived. And so the Church of Rome thought, how can we solve this problem? We are losing property when bishops children die. You know, I mean, when the bishop dies, the family is claiming the building. It's okay, let's create something. If you are going to be a priest, you must sign off, you won't marry. Now look at the result all over the world. In some places you see the result is terrible. Whether it's with children or with other people's wives or other things, that place where the priest is, that place where the priest is and people are vulnerable and the trust is shattered. It's a global phenomenon. Why? Because it was a forced celibacy. Yeshua said it's to those to whom he's given. Those to whom he's given. You know it. Whether male or female. And if one has the gift of celibacy, it is better not to marry. Because if you marry, you can't handle marriage. Are you hearing me? And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul deals with it. So study it. So because marriage carries some pressures. Can we say it together? Marriage carries some pressures. Pressure of pregnancy, for instance. <laughs> pressure of breastfeeding. Pressure of raising children. And if the children are difficult, Lord have mercy. Yes. Pressure of financial inadequacy. Especially if people have, illust have already constructed in their mind what they think is what they need. Their status they want for. And all their life they are looking forward to it. Only to enter. One year, two years, who said? Three, five. It's not happened. Pressures. So that's why the Lord wants us to be sure that whatever we are doing in marriage, for those who are single, that we are doing according to the will of Father. What this course will do is for those who are across the world who are single, this course will prepare you like no other thing you have ever had. This course is going to prepare you. You know what you are going into. You count the cost. You pray and the Lord will give you confirmation. And there's no fear in law, in marriage. No fear. You know why? Marriage is essentially a faith walk. Can we say faith walk? 
Yeah. If you want to know everything in the end from the beginning, you are mistaken. You won't. In the place called Igbo land in Africa, there's what they call Ngugu. Marriage is like Ngugu. <laughs> you go to the market, you buy a bean, you know, this bean something, they chop it all up, they take leaf, layers and layers and layers of leaf, they tie it and tie it. When you buy it, it looks huge. You take it home, you remove the string, you take away the first layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer, at times ten layers of leaves before you get to the small thing there inside. That's how marriage is. So there must be faith in he who tells you. And when he speaks to you, let nothing take out what he tells you from you. Let nothing. Someone say, let nothing. Let nothing. The moment you are sure of Elohim's voice, you know how he speaks to you. We are going to talk about how he speaks to you. The moment you ask, he tells you, you don't have to know everything. Listen, you don't have to know everything. But the moment he tells you, it doesn't matter what you hear from people. Oh, I want to tell you something. Hey, this woman you want to marry, this man you want to marry, tell them. Like that woman, what's that name? That, that woman that uh, the prophet, you know, you know, prayed for and she got a baby. And then when she was going, the baby died and she was going. Everyone met her, tried to talk her. He said, it is well. Once you are sure of the will of the father, learn to say it is well. Say it to people, say it to yourself. Encourage yourself to stand on the will of the father. Faith will procure blessings. At the end of the day, faith will take you there. Faith will make you to see beyond. Amen. So what the Lord is saying is, this is a cause that will help you to understand the will of the father. It will help you to understand this institution. If you are in it, it will help you to navigate it. Because the marriage from a kingdom perspective is not about making the man happy or the woman happy. It's about pleasing Elohim. Amen. Are you hearing me? It's about what? Pleasing Elohim of heaven. Amen. The moment you understand this, you are not going to be swayed. Most times, most teachings of marriage are tilted one way or the other. Some people teach a masculine interpretation of marriage. It's male dominated. It's male chauvinistic. Other people teach a feminine dominated one. You know? And other people teach a cultural one according to the culture of the nation where you were born. But this one, the Lord wants to get us to kingdom culture in marriage. Because marriage is one of the avenues for expression of kingdom culture. Amen? Can we say avenue? Avenue. Of kingdom culture. Kingdom. Expression of kingdom culture. It's a marriage that the kingdom should be demonstrated. And so it's so important. Men and brethren, listen all of you. Before we close, I want to say this to you. One of the things that everyone needs to do, and we're going to talk about this in particular as we go on, is this. In marriage, it doesn't matter how you are developed as a woman, you're a professor, you are wealthy, you're from a great family. The day you say, I do, you have submitted to the authority of the man in your life. The authority is not for evil. The authority is not for the man to oppress you. But that is the reality. The day you deny that reality, you have denied marriage. And this is not a comfortable thing to tell more than women. And I know many of the women across the world say, hey, 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 what's going on? Listen, that is exactly what the word says. The moment, and that's why as you go on, even things, you have to be careful. Don't supplant the authority of the father in the eye of the children. The greatest way to destroy your children is to supplant the authority of the father. If you treat him as if he's not there, you are missing it. It will affect the children. They will find it difficult to accept authority figures. And so that's why wise women affirm your husband. He may not have money, affirm him. As long as you're married. He may not have a this or that or that, affirm him. Affirm him. Even the areas you have greater strength than him, you must learn to do all the things in the background and give him the credit. Did you hear me? Yes, it's something difficult for the flesh to accept. But the honest thing is if you want your children to understand the kingdom, the kingdom is based on principles. One of them is principle of authority. 
Don't ever let the children see you as independent of able to take your decisions, say what you want to say, do whatever you want to do. If you do that, you are not helping them to understand the kingdom. Amen? And if you're a man, you must come to the place where you do everything in your power to honor your wife, to cover her, to love her. Never speak evil to your children about your spouse. Never. No matter what. Never. I'd rather pray it in. Tell it to the Father. I want to know. I know today there may be very interesting in this matter. So can we take one or two questions then we close. Okay. Those who are here and those who are online. If you're online, Mr. Gose is on standby. Pastor Grace is on standby to receive your questions. And if you are here, you want to ask a question. Yes. Can you ask any question? Amen. Those online, any question? All right. So we're going to have some good time. Amen. We're going to have a number of sessions. Let's really give it our best shot. August is going to be a moon. The Lord shared with me. He whispered to me to tell our people. This moon proposed to please the Father in all things. Notwithstanding what you are going through, notwithstanding situations you face, make sure that your heart is inclined to please the Father. He says, when your heart is inclined, he will release grace for it to be cut down. So inclined to please him in everything. And also he said, worship, praise, thanksgiving should be in spite of, not because of. Worship, praise, thanksgiving. Let it be in spite of not. Don't wait till you have got that miracle before you testify. Don't wait till because you have got that miracle before you feel happy. No. Learn to be thankful to the Father. Learn to exalt Him in spite of any situation. This is going to be the key to victory this month and the season we are in. Amen. Incline your heart to please Him in all things. Amen. Don't look at people. Look at Him. Be conscious of Him. In marriage, brothers and sisters, the greatest thing we can ever do is to be conscious of the omniscience and omnipresence of the Father. Because he's the one that sees everything at the end of the day. Any question? Okay, let's rise up and pray. Pastor Grace, can you go?